Awesome. And we are live. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to another product school talk. I'm Cassandra. Um, just want to make sure that you guys can see and uh, hear me okay. So if you can hear me, uh, go ahead and type in book into the comment section and uh, you'll get a free copy of our, our <laughs> recently released uh, the product book. <laughs> we'll make sure you get one as well of course um okay well as many of you uh know it look, well it looks like yeah we're working well uh so as many of you know we teach product management coding and data now across 14 campuses so we've just recently launched seven new campuses uh five within the u.s uh one in toronto another one in london um, so today's speaker is going to share some insights into product management um, over at LinkedIn. So I'd like to welcome Christian Baiza. Hi, Christian. Hi, nice to, nice to meet you, everyone. Uh, I don't know who is there or if there's even anyone, but I assume because you just said that <laughs> there were people commenting that there is someone. Um, yeah, I just take it from here, I guess, right? So I, I just dive into my presentation right away. Sure, absolutely. And just a, just a quick reminder to, uh, to everybody uh, following Christian's presentation, we are going to open the floor for Q&A. Uh, so you can feel free to type in your questions into the comments after. So Christian, I'll let you take it from here. Cool. Thank you so much. All right, let me just share my screen quickly um, and then uh, let's go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Cool. All right, perfect. Cool. So yeah, uh, the, the talk is about 10 commandments of international product management because I work actually on the international side of LinkedIn. Um, and before I do that, just a quick background. So I uh, used to work for this startup and we got acquired by Adobe, uh, not by Photoshop, obviously, because it was a, a digital marketing uh, company and we built basically uh, stuff around Facebook advertising. So very vertical approach in a sense. So think about uh, you, you spend lots of money on Facebook and you wanna have some extra tool that manages that spend. So the solution from Adobe was basically doing that next to a, a bunch of other stuff. So basically Facebook ads was a part of my life for a couple of years um, in San Francisco. And then uh, LinkedIn uh, basically knocked on my door uh, to start that. In between, I also started a company uh, here in Germany and actually right now in Munich, um, you see the LinkedIn office of Munich in the background. And uh, it's a conference uh, held in Hamburg once a year. We had uh, this year about 26,000 uh, guests. So next to being a product manager, I basically have some like a side project and this guy, as some of you may know, Casey Nates, that was one of our speakers this year. So kind of lots of little fun projects on the side. But let me um, yeah, dive into what I'm doing at LinkedIn. So again, uh, two years ago, LinkedIn knocked on my door and said, hey, Christian, you're a product manager. You are from Germany. Um, you live here in San Francisco. Don't you want to like do Germany for us? And um, basically um, the, the challenge for me was initially to, to understand what that really mean. It's like being responsible for for a region. So instead of me being responsible for some product, what I was in the past, so at LinkedIn, uh, actually now Microsoft, as, as many of you know, and uh, Germany is, is the market that I'm responsible for. Technically, the entire DACH region, Austria, Switzerland, uh, and, and Germany, but really only Germany because that's kind of the market that, um, that we think about most. Uh, and we have this local competitor there um, that is kind of in front of us. So we need to go after them. Um, and the question was then when when they asked me like okay um you want you, do you want to be responsible for region as a product manager and that's basically the part, first part of my presentation the difference between vertical and horizontal product management which was somewhat new to me at that uh, stage and um and then afterwards i will uh, dive into the 10 rules that kind of develop over time so what does vertical product management means um if you think about product management uh, usually you know, you're responsible for some kind of slice of the pie, meaning you're responsible, like in my last job, for Facebook advertising, for example. Or if you think about LinkedIn as a product that many of you probably use and know, um, we have product managers that are responsible for the company page or for messaging or for feed relevance or like for, for some of our recruiter products. So you are always organized in a very vertical way. And that means you are kind of the expert for that particular field you know everything about it, you don't think anything else, you usually try to bring that product forward. And that is usually, you know, comes with the ownership, with the responsibility. So you really like push that product forward. And of course, if you if you are that person in, in part of a bigger organization, you work with other teams as well, but you are that one expert that really works on that particular field. And then when LinkedIn asked me to kind of run Germany in a sense from a product perspective, 
they were like, okay, um, you know, you, you have the responsibility, but not really the authority because you're just responsible for the market, but not for the actual product. So horizontal basically means that you are responsible for this market itself and the market has its different challenges, right? As I mentioned earlier, we have a local competitor here in Germany and um, being not the number one in the region, we had to play, or we are facing basically completely different challenges from, from what you are faced uh, elsewhere in, in, in the world because you know it's not that LinkedIn comes to mind when you think about um, business networking. So it's not only that you, you know, exchange one part of the product, but you literally own kind of the entire experience end to end, meaning you need to think about onboarding, you need to think about the, the marketing strategy, you need to think about business development partnerships, you need to think about pricing, and all these different variations within the product need to be prioritized next to each other. And then the big question is what is more important, right? Is it more important to change the price or is it more, more important to optimize your onboarding flow to get new members? So typically, or most, most companies that I talk to um, that um, also are, have these challenges to go abroad and go international have um, like, uh, or define a true north metric that you go after and then you try to align the entire company or all the different teams that you work with to go after the target. So for us, for example, it's just signups right now. So we really, really try to focus on, on growth, on member growth, because we are just simply not the number one network in the region. So you need to like really um, align all the different teams towards that true north metric. And the interesting part is in a global organization that you know, like especially with American companies usually have some kind of matrix organization. So that means marketing reports into marketing, BD, reports into BD, product into product, and so forth. So the, the issue was basically that globally, LinkedIn doesn't care so much about member growth anymore. I mean, we still, of course, care about member growth, but our, our main objective for our true north is more engagement. So we want to have the existing members back on the platform so that they have daily use cases to use our products to get, a, get to know our feed and you know, basically create daily use cases. But in Germany, we're at a different stage. So if the marketing department, for example, thinks that you know, um, globally, we run a marketing campaign in Germany that might be completely different here because we're just at a different stage. So instead of again being responsible for just one slice of the pie and working on your one product, you can't, you, you suddenly have all these different challenges across all these different organizations. And I mean, it's also one of my rules that, uh, that I will talk about, but suddenly you have the responsibility, but you don't have the authority necessarily. And so that's one of the reasons why I, for example, travel here quite a bit. So just uh, counted today because I did it all hands here in, in our Munich office. I was nine times in Germany this year because it just requires lots of face-to-face -face time. And instead of, you know, just like doing uh, video conferences and, and working with uh, uh, people in a room, you suddenly have to bridge like oceans in between. And it doesn't apply to Germany like any other market that you go to. And instead of being like a, a specialist in one area, you suddenly become this like general manager about the entire experience and that brings completely new challenges. But it's also tremendous fun, you know, because when, when you're in this vertical world, you kind of are this one expert. Like in my past job, I was just working on Facebook ads. And of course, you know, you kind of get to know everything about it, but also you just breathe and think and talk the entire time just about the same topic. And I really enjoy working in this horizontal work suddenly because in the morning I can think about marketing during the day, I can think about you know, like onboarding and in the evening we think about pricing. So you have way more challenges and you learn so much more because you work with so many more teams uh, together. But again, it is, it is much harder because you have to align all these teams to go after your target. And especially if they have a different manager and have a different structure that they report into and their managers again, tell them something different. Um, it's just always this challenge of aligning these teams. And that's why you have to go there um, actually quite a bit. But let me go into basically the 10 rules um, that I kind of identified for myself. And it's funny because I, I kind of gave a similar talk um, like this uh, in the past, like when I when I worked in, uh, at uh, Adobe, at, where I was not a horizontal uh, product manager, but like on the vertical side. So I also defined these uh, like 10 rules of like how, how, what I think like product management should be and what you should work on. And then over time I realized that it's completely different. So these 10 rules that I have today and LinkedIn are not necessarily the 10 rules that apply maybe for your role as a product manager, or if you're not a product manager yet for maybe the, the future product management role that you have. So take these with a grain of salt and like, remember that my, my position is probably like a little bit different from most uh, PM roles. Um, but if you are in the position of working in some kind of international organization and you need to take your product abroad, be, either be a 
a small startup or a big organization, then this may apply to you, but maybe not for all of you. So let me get into the 10. Um, so the first one is build relationships within the company. Um, I found this tremendously um, important, probably the most important thing of all of them. That's also why it's number one. Because again, you are not responsible for any product in a sense, right? You are responsible for the market. So one good example, like we changed the premium price for LinkedIn uh, in Germany. So we had a competition, we had uh, found out that Germans just don't like to pay as much for digital services. So we realized that we had to adjust the price. You can't just apply, adjust the price. You need to kind of build the relationship with the team that is responsible for the pricing and then kind of motivate them that this is actually something that we should do. I mean, in our case, I have engineering myself. So I have basically a team of about 10 engineers that I can go to these teams and say, hey, we would like to change the price. I bring my engineering along, but then there's still you know, agreement that you need to create. And you can only create this if you have the relationships with all these different teams. So a big part of my time is like doing roadshows across different teams. So the last couple of weeks, for example, I just like met six, seven different teams, invited all the engineering, UX, data science, all the different teams, just to tell them, what are we doing in Germany? Why are we doing it? Why is it different from the rest of the world? And uh, what, what is basically our strategy to kind of align them and to later when I actually want to work on one of their projects, then kind of have that relationship. So that's why really number one, the relationship piece is really the most important piece. Um, the second time, and you see it right now, I'm in Munich, um, spend time in market. Um, uh, one thing that I uh, realize is also that you should also just go by yourself. Um, if you always like organize trips for others, uh, or if you go like in a group, then you kind of become very quickly that person that is kind of the organizer, the trip organizer, which is also great fun, great stuff that you do with people, but you kind of tend to do this all just within the company and you spend a lot of time with your colleagues. But what you really want to do is you want to be in market to spend time with the actual users and um, not just with your colleagues in the evening having a beer, right? You want to talk to people from that industry, you want to kind of network, you want to go to events. And if you just go with people that you already know, um, you might not get the most out of it. So that's why, um, again, I travel to that region to really understand it if you're not like originally from it. So I mean, it helps that I'm in Germany by myself and I kind of uh, know certain things uh, that, that are just different here in the market. But again, like go by yourself as well, um, position just by yourself. Um, the next one is also related to, tra to travel. So, of course, it depends on how big the company is and what budget uh, the company has. But at LinkedIn, we realized that organizing trips for other people to bring them into the market is really useful. So we um, have other key markets as well at LinkedIn. So China and India, for example, are other areas where we have a dedicated product and engineering team. And we learned in these markets that it's tremendously helpful to bring all the way up to like our CEO and and, and other product executives and just people that work on products that are somewhat broken for the area into the region. So once a year, I take like 10 to 15 people with me, travel to Germany, go from city to city, have a bunch of meetings set up with like clients and customers and but also users with people that don't like us, with people that like us to make kind of bring this understanding. And that kind of feeds into number one, right? If you organize amazing trips for people, then uh, you also can build uh, good relationships, of course, and in general, like having trips is basically like a long offside in a sense where you go for dinner for a couple of days and then these relationships bound you really well within the organization um, to execute those well. I alluded to this one earlier that you need to create a, a true north. Um, what I add here is that you need to defend it. Uh, I mentioned this earlier already that global organizations may have a different true north than the one that you have defined for your region. Again, like if you go into a new market, you might be in the situation where you know you want to grow members rather than having them engage because you need to build members first before you can engage them. So it is really hard to kind of really make sure that you have that one true north that you go after. And when you go after that, really prioritize and try to get other stuff out of your way, especially if you, uh, in my case, for example, have already a team on the ground. So when I first joined, we had about 30 people here on the ground in sales you know, suddenly they realize, okay, there is someone that can help them, can fix all their needs. And, but those needs are not, maybe not necessarily towards your true north metric there. For me, again, like we want to create signups and we may have issues in, in some of our B2B solutions. So we need to kind of shear these things away from you and you need to learn. And I think 
as any product manager, you need to learn how to say no and prioritize things. But especially I have the feeling in this field where you have so many different areas that you could tackle and fix, um, you really need to like focus and, and, and go after your dream rather than really depending. Um, one other thing uh, that is tremendously important, I think also again, as almost any product manager, that you need data access. And if, you, if you're not a data scientist yourself or if you don't have the abilities to like pull data out of Teradata and if you can't write SQL queries and those kind of things, then you need to have someone that you work with very closely and you can trust in because uh, it's a difference if you go to some other team and tell them, you know, in that market we have, I don't know, like half as many messages that people receive um, and because of that, we need to do this and that, right? So if you always come from a data standpoint, rather than like, yeah, like messaging is broken in the market, you kind of create a much better trust with other people because they have the feeling you know what you're talking about. So I just like recommend that you work with either, like if you have the skills by yourself, always from a data standpoint first, or if you don't, then work with your, your, your data scientist or your, your analytics um, counterpart. Um, and then this applies to every feature that you build, right? It's also always about sizing, prioritizing, uh, and then by that, you have a much better standing within the company. Number six is pure execution. Um, again, like if you travel a lot, if you uh, spend lots of time with other teams and building relationships, it's also very easy to lose track of your actual true north again, because there's so much stuff that you need to defend and declare and like work with other people and align people. But in the end, you also need to make these changes. So I think the execution in itself is just something, I mean, again, in any product job, it's something that you just have to do. Like, and even if it's something that may be annoying and you need to like go through some like uh, manual exercises to get certain things through. Like I remember when, when we first joined, we had like a massive issue with like translation of titles. So just made the decision to like translate those titles manually myself and just a couple of thousand um, uh, uh, titles that I just went through because I knew like if I had to wait until some smart person would do this like very like in scale with like with, like machine learning or whatnot you know then it would have taken us weeks or months and I knew if I just sit down now for like two days in a row I could do this uh, much better so I think always that as a product manager sometimes you just need to like get shit done um, and I mean probably that applies to any job in in the sense, but especially as a PM, I think this is very important not to lose track of, of that. Um, one other thing, number seven here, is that you have the challenge in international markets that your audience might be much slower. I mean, I don't know how and what products you are working, but usually at least at LinkedIn, whatever we do, we test it first, right? So we have all these A-B testing capabilities in place and you ramp a new feature to a certain percentage. So let's say you optimize the certain onboarding flow so you ramp that new onboarding flow that you develop to one percent and you keep the rest to see if something is happening then you may ramp it a little bit higher and you ramp it a little bit higher the problem in the market where you don't have as many data points is that you you just don't get to this dead sick results as fast right if i have like a hundred thousand people a day on a certain feature i can realize very quickly if that change is actually making an impact or if it's not making an impact so in regions, when you internationalize, you have this challenge that you don't have as many data points. So you actually have to you know, uh, keep uh, those experiments that you have running a bit longer. And that's always pain in the ass, right? Because you have all these great ideas and you build something, you ramp it to like maybe 10, 20%, and then you have to wait. And you literally have to wait for like two, three weeks sometimes until you can make a decision. But if you make the decision too quickly, um, you, you, you may not be able to um, really understand the impact of the experiments um, that you just went. Number eight, um, report your wins even more. Um, that is something that I was really bad at and I'm still like in progress of learning, but um, you test so many things and usually you work on a product that is already highly optimized, but it's not that you know, the onboarding flow was just invented for like last week, but and usually it was probably already there for a couple of months or years even. And now you go into a new market and you think, okay, you optimize it. But then when you have these wins, you need to celebrate them because if your managers don't know that you have these wins, you're like getting questioned um, very quickly because in going international is ex expensive, right? You have not only the cost of the team that works on, you, you have the travel cost, you have all the translation costs. And sometimes people forget um, that uh, also when you individualize stuff, 
for that particular region that you can also ramp it to other parts of the world. But that's why it's so important to celebrate these wins and report them so that people have the feeling that their team is actually doing something. And you know, a good example is if, if, you, if you work for a vertical product, it's very easy to see what you do, right? Because you ramp, I don't know, new, new, new buttons or new features to like something or let's say you're responsible at LinkedIn, for example, for messaging and you add like smart replies to a feature, you know, it's very easy to see. Um, but when, when we ramp features, we kind of switch little things back and forth within the onboarding flow, change the positions of button that are not very like big wins. And then you kind of increase your signups by like 0.3%. And it's a big win uh, for that particular market, but globally it doesn't seem like a big impact, but people need to know what you're doing. Otherwise they, they quickly forget um, or, or what you're doing. Um, number nine is that you need to invest also into the value for your members and customers uh, we quickly forget that because we see like lots of bugs that we want to fix and we have the true north that we are going after but it's not only about that right you also need to think about the differences in market and one thing for example that we also only realized recently at linkedin was that germans love to congratulate other people to their birthday it's it's hilarious like Nowhere in the world, people like to congratulate or receive birthday messages on scale. But in Germany, like everyone loves it. Everyone wants to wake up in the morning, get some email reminders to send people birthday reminders. I think and we don't even ask for the birthday, really. I mean, there's a field you can fill it out. But that's something that is, for some reason, valuable. And me, as a German alone, I just counted today because we discussed this. Like, I can sing six birthday songs by heart. Um, and I could, like, literally, like, it's just something that, that people like do in this country and for people here it's very valuable to, to get from their business contact like a birthday reminder so that is something that i kind of almost define as a valuable product that you have to do that is completely unapplicable like for any other region right we had like had a large meeting today and we kind of made this fun like even in the netherlands like just across the border basically people were like what was the birthday who wants a birthday it's like in the u.s people celebrate their birthday a week before the actual birthday happens if you did that in germany everyone would be like oh my god this is like bringing bad luck so don't like i, I would never do this so uh, there's something where we bring value so we build features for uh, that market that is where it is so different so just you know don't only do the valuable like go after your true north uh, stuff but also go after like really value that kind of keep people longer as for you uh, but again it's like about this prioritization and like kind of uh, struggle back and forth what to do next with the resources you have and then the last one it always sounds a bit like negative but i literally constantly have to justify my existence um uh, or the right of existence that i have because you know sometimes not everything works as you expect, right? You have, again, a highly optimized product that was built maybe over a couple of years and then you try lots of stuff and then maybe it doesn't work, right? Not every experiment works really well. I remember when I first joined, uh, I thought, okay, our guest homepage, so if you just, go, if you log out and you go to linkedin.com, um, I mean, probably don't do that because that page is like pretty ugly. Um, but that page, I thought, oh my God, that must be so easy to increase the conversion rate on that page. And we got tons of traffic on that page. And we tested so many things, like I, probably like 20 different variations or even more. And nothing moved the needle at all. And people then questioned suddenly, what are you doing that you wasted like three months on this? And nothing happened. Um, so you need to justify basically what are you doing. And again, it goes back to this, also celebrating your wins. But you need to kind of, come up with reasons why what you're doing is also very valuable. And one other, uh, one other thing that also helps you a lot is that you don't only work for international, right? So even, I, even though I focus on Germany, every feature that we build, for example, we build also for the US right? Be or for any other market. So we build everything in English pretty much and then translate it also to German. We test it in Germany first, but if it works, we also roll it out elsewhere in the world and then we bring basically that impact also to the rest of the, uh, of the company. And that is also something that helped us tremendously in the past where we kind of had really big wins and then we were able to ramp them elsewhere in the world and by that basically justifying again uh, our, our, our existence in the team. Um, yeah, so I think that, that basically uh, uh, yeah, concludes my list. Um, I have just two more quick things uh, for you. So there is this awesome article on Fast Company that I, I recommend. It's a couple of months old, but um, um, great article about like, how Facebook views data science uh, and 
to reach uh, millions of users or billions of users. So yeah, there's a link there in my, my slide deck if you want to check that out. And then there's one other article that I love, which is this good product managers, bad product managers. This is like super, super old. So this is from like 2000, uh, uh, it's not even older. I think it's like 10, 15 years old or something. Um, and the funny thing is, is <laughs> the, whenever I read this, I feel how bad as a product manager I am. Um, because there are so many things that I don't do as, as this person suggests, but it helps you to remind yourself what are good, like good habits. And then uh, just recently, um, I uh, gave a talk similar to this and someone said, hey, did you see there's this new article? And so there's this new article that was just uh, written in October this year, actually from last year, um, but I only found it like a couple of weeks ago. Um, and there's this person that kind of picks up on that original article 19 years ago where it was written initially and kind of makes an updated list to like modern product management from nowadays. So I just highly recommend reading these two articles because they really help um, and uh, you know reflect and uh, again, anytime I read these uh, these articles, I realize okay, I still have to learn a lot, and um, there are a bunch of there's a bunch of stuff that I could do better. But um, yeah, I think that's all from my end. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, obviously, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Awesome, thank you so much for the presentation. I love that you mentioned birthdays too, and about those small details that really make things um, more valuable to to everyone. Um, Great. So we had a few questions come in on on Facebook. So I I'd, I'd love to to get a couple of those answered as long as we have some time here. So um, let's see. There was there were a couple of questions in regards to what you mean by true north, and if you could give some examples. So for example, from Pat and Michael, um, could a true north be revenue or conversion? And can you can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, yeah sure. I mean, every company probably has a different true north. Um, I can just say like for what we have. Um, I mean, for some reason, uh, for some companies, it's um, a number of engagement. At LinkedIn, we call that engaged quality member. So basically member that is somewhat engaged. So we have different um, variables that we define, like how often he logs in and how, how, how many contacts he has. And so basically how valuable he is for for the platform so it doesn't necessarily mean that we need new members that become an engage quality member also existing dormant members basically that signed up in the past but never really came back could become that so that's one true north metric that we have at the company but then again like what i mentioned earlier is that for germany itself we have or i have personally just um quality signups so basically signups that are somewhat uh, of high quality uh, and to answer your question, you know, your true north can be anything that you want um, as soon as, uh, or as long as you kind of align the company after that. So revenue or like, yeah, conversions, whatever, whatever you define basically becomes the true north metric. Um, okay, awesome. Thank you for, um, thank you for sharing more on that. Um, another question, this one is from Pat as well. How much SQL or data analyst do you do on a daily basis? And how often are you explaining things to different teams? And how important is it to convey your thoughts and words clearly? Yeah. So on the SQL part, um, to, uh, luckily not that often. So I have a uh, background in business. So I studied just uh, business uh, administration in, in uh, university. So I'm not like a technical person per se, but I kind of am able to get access to Teradata and I have a couple of scripts that someone else wrote. So I know how to type them in there and like how to tweak them a little bit, but maybe like, once a week or so, I pull some report down. And fortunately, I'm in a company where I have the resources that are much better at that. So I can just like yeah, ping them and then they do it for me. So that's a fortunate situation. Um, no, I forgot the, the, uh, the, the second, second, second part. What was the second part of the <laughs> um, how, how, uh, yeah. How often are you explaining things to different teams and how important is it to convey your thoughts and words? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? so on the other teams, um, and literally every day. Um, that is, it's most, it's, I mean, it's, again, it's like the international part, right? Where some, something comes up like almost every day where you want to ramp a new feature and you're so excited about it. And then someone else comes around the corner. So, oh, no, we stopped like supporting this. And um, we don't think that this is right. And they need to expand it again. Um, that I did this roadshow across all the different teams. I just started doing that. Uh, I just started doing this this quarter and I found this tremendously helpful, um, especially not only talking to PMs that I usually did, but also to their engineering counterparts, to their designers, so that kind of like all the important people in that particular org understand. And then the last piece on like how to articulate yourself. I think that's in general one of the most important pieces. And for me as a non-native speaker, that's, I mean, it's, it's probably like the, the biggest challenge to like 
speak really clearly and what you want and get to the point very quickly and um you know don't like just like talk about some unimportant stuff first it goes back to also this um this uh, point of like come up with data first so it was also something i had to learn first I, when i tried to convince someone that i kind of start the argument with some numbers with some percentages so that people have this feeling that i or i or he knows stuff what he's talking about so i think it is very important to like be really clear um uh, again i mean we have I mean, we have about 180 product managers at LinkedIn. Uh, I would say only half of them are probably from the US and the rest of them are somewhere from else from the world. So language is, 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 is certainly not something that should stop. Um, but I think, yeah, it's probably one of the most important pieces in the job every day. Yeah, I absolutely, absolutely agree with that as well. Um, here we have another question from um, Loannis. Regarding execution, do you directly guide the engineers, engineering teams towards in implementation or is there one or more product owners or other role um, who do that so that you can focus more on marketing or user research or product strategy roadmap, etc. Yeah. yeah, so at LinkedIn we have um, basically always a product manager teamed up with an engineering manager. So remember, as a product manager, you usually, you usually, unless you get into like the manager track as a product manager, starting like after a senior, you become group product manager, you usually don't have direct reports, right? So you have a bunch of dotted lines, makes alignment even harder because you can come into the room and talk to the marketing folks and tell them all day long what they should do. They don't have to do it from a manager standpoint, right? So because they report to the marketing organization and engineering the same thing. Um, that's why relationships are so important. That's why I built relationships with each one of my engineers and really like try to understand what they are doing also. But then again, you know, you don't go to an engineer in your team and ask them, hey, can you do this for me? You have sprint planning, you align with your engineering manager on what you want to do. Uh, and anyone can come up with ideas and that is also being prioritized. But, you know, I never tell anyone what to do. I you know, it says like leading by questions is always what I say. So you, um, you kind of, uh, yeah, uh, uh, like try to, to uh, basically kind of create this vision of why people should do something. And, uh, and then, yeah, you work with your engineering counterpart and then he tells people what to do. And actually it's a nice thing that you don't have to do all these one-on-ones and talk about like personal problems of people and need to think about like, how should I increase the salary and all this kind of like manager stuff. So I really enjoy not having like a huge amount of direct reports. Like my engineering kind of has like 16, 17 direct reports, I think. And if you just think about the time that he needs to spend in one-on-ones with, with these people, I truly enjoy that. I don't have to do um, these kind of things and really can focus on like the strategy of what we actually would like to do um, and, and work with other teams to actually get stuff done. So I think that's my answer on that. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, empowering them to do their, their, <laughs> their part as well. Um, awesome. We have time for just uh, maybe one or two more questions. So um, this one is from Farbab. What are some data ana analysis tools that you suggest for product managers, for example, like Tableau or, or Power BI? Yeah. Yeah. So I work with both. Um, I'm not a big fan of Tableau because uh, it's very buggy, at least how we have it set up, I have the feeling. So uh, I'm in the fortunate situation um, that we uh, have our own developed uh, solutions at LinkedIn. So we basically have, yeah, uh, we call this like a Raptor, it's kind of an internal solution that uh, we have an engineering product team that just built that for the LinkedIn case, um, which is really powerful because it has access to all the data. Um, Power BI I used uh, together with like marketing uh, folks because you can like feed in very nicely and very easily um, just data uh, data feeds Excel files pretty much uh, CSVs and then you can like individualize it very very well. Um, almost think in marketing it's probably like one of the most uh, powerful solutions out there and not because I work for Microsoft but really because I believe that it's one of the most powerful BI tools in the market. Um, also, Adobe Analytics uh, is something like if you work for a larger organization, um, and I worked at Adobe, so I kind of am biased uh, on that end as well. But um, that is definitely also a very nice analytics uh, solution uh, for people to understand how, how to track funnels and how to understand the impact from one step to the next one. Um, yeah, but um, other than that, I can't give you that much of, much of an insight, to be honest. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, thank you again for, for joining us today. I think that's all the, the time we have for, for questions. I know a few of you have asked or requested the links that um, Christian shared. So we'll drop those into the Facebook comments here as well. And 
make sure you guys get those. Um, before we go, Christian, um, would you mind sharing your advice for aspiring product managers out there? Ah, advice. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I, that is really hard because I, 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 I didn't know that a product manager exists. Uh, existed when I still lived in Germany. I I was always a product manager somehow. So I always like thought about like what can I do better, what can what what are like ideas I can work on. I started a bunch of like failed companies myself. Like um, I always had like ideas when I saw something I wanted to like make it better. When I was like sixteen or so, my uncle said you like a black hole searcher where I've, like try to find problems and then optimize them in a sense. Um, uh, what is a good advice? I mean, I think I can talk to like what we look for at LinkedIn when, or when I personally just talk to, to product managers, uh, basically like probably three things um, that I look for most. Uh, one is curiosity. So I really look for people that are curious to like solve problems that they see. And in an interview, you can see this very quickly if someone is like really engaged and like hears and wants to know more and like, like really like be energetic about it. Um, um, the, the the second one is if someone is somewhat inspiring and it's something you probably can't almost learn but yeah, I get that like, within like two minutes talking to someone if he has some cool idea if he worked at some cool like project in the past and it doesn't need to no mean that it must have been like super successful right just but having this drive to like starting like something yourself maybe during university time or afterwards so if someone like inspires me with what he's talking about um, that, that uh, certainly helps and uh and and then the last one is probably just be like super open um because it goes back to this earlier question of how important communication is but um if you can't like stand up in front of a crowd and i did an all hands here today in our office like i, I mean there were 80 people or so and if you kind of stand there and you don't know what to say and you can't make like little jokes and so forth i mean it is important to be like the funny nice guy also um but you also need to be very like hard and strict and like straightforward in other, other situations but i think it's very important that you are able to just you know, communicate your ideas freely and i don't have an issue in talking in front of other people because that's essentially in the end always what you do right you build something to present it you need to like defend it you need to like convince other people to do something and it goes back to this one thing that i said earlier many times you have the responsibility but not the authority and you can only solve that by like being kind of a good personality in a sense. And it's hard to learn. And I also don't say that I'm perfect at that, um, but it's certainly something that I look for in interview processes. Uh, that was all. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, well, thank you again so much for your time today. It was a great presentation and great Q and A session. So we appreciate you being here. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, good luck everyone. And again, right. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Great. Awesome. And, um, and guys, as you know, you can get more information on us at productschool.com. If you haven't yet, you can still type in book in the comments and get your free copy. And thanks everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.